Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. What a big treat. Um, I think, Shelly Joe, I think you win the award. I think uh, we probably kicked off this conversation to try to make this happen um, before COVID. <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it was like, <laughs> I think it was, I Maybe. think it was after two, right? Y two K. No, it was like uh, 20, <laughs> 2020 at some point. But um, but for everyone's benefit, listen. Good things come to those who wait, and those of us that are allies of people who stutter, um, we practice that and we learn that again and again. And that might be the best thing: is giving people the time they need. Better things will come when we don't rush or push. That's right. Um, so Shelly Joe said, "Listen." Just give me a few more days. I got some exciting things cooking and I'd really love to share. So just hang on and having um, the excitement that I have and the regard that I have for Dr. Shelley Joe Craft and a little bit of impulsivity. I was a little bit like, okay, this will be a good exercise to lean into. Mm. Just good things will come. And I'm so glad I did because I got well, an this idea. pandemic has really taught us all how to be a mm. little patient and how to uh, adjust our lives accordingly, right? There we go. So maybe we can both talk about that. That'd be cool. But um, I'll just give the, the boring intro. So my name is Ori Schneider. I'm like the accident, accidental podcaster here. And um, it's a treat to have people like Dr. Shelley Joe Kraft, who also gets the award for the longest bio that anyone has shared with me. Oh, really? Um, I get lots okay. of awards today. I love awards. Awards are good. Listen, Vivian Siskin also said to me, how long should it be? I said, just send me the bio. And I figured it'd be like most people's bio. It's like a paragraph or two. And then you get like Vivian Siskin and you get you. And it's like, okay. I think Facebook said that I, you know, I've used too many letters. This <laughs> There's month, a lot you know? to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I made sure that uh, Vivian Siskin and you did not appear in the same month because I would have had right. to pay overages. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So the boring bio or the short on the long, which you can see in the description, it'll be up on the podcast notes and in the uh, blog. Dr. Kraft, like where to even begin? Her current research focuses on biological and behavioral genetics of stuttering, autism, SLI, SSD, and hearing loss um, as speech language pathologists. We have an alphabet soup of acronyms and things, but we can talk about what all that means. But really it has to do with looking at how things interact with one another and getting a really good deep understanding because with better understanding, we can create a better world for people, both people living with these different things as well as people that are devoted to helping. So her other research includes the neuroanatomical and functional features of people who stutter, uh, auditory feedback, mechanisms of speech control, autism treatment strategies, new genetic analysis techniques for modeling epigenetic complexity, and exploring the relationship between cognition, temperament, and stuttering severity, simple stuff like that. She's the director of Behavior, Speech, and Genetics Lab, um, and the majority of her research is conducted over there, and her research really showcases novel approaches to the identification of gene-to-gene -gene interaction and regulation as new genetic methodologies offer a promise of identifying ideological bases for many developmental disorders, including speech and language disorders. And I'm loving putting a little you know, drama to this because it is darn exciting, to be honest. I mean, crunching the numbers and looking at the data, that's not what excites me. But when I hear that other people are doing it, I get so excited <laughs> to learn off of their off of their you know, data and columns and crunching. But uh, her, her research team collaborates with the University of Texas, Baylor Medical, Vanderbilt. They recently awarded a huge grant from the National Institute of Health, that's NIH, like that's, that's where it's at, to identify the genes for stuttering. Um, I'll stop there, but you get the idea. We're in the presence of greatness. And we also have some connections through some global research teams that are working on things across different disciplines. It is a tremendous honor. And I think you can tell how excited I am to have this conversation with you and share it with our friends around the world. Well, the honor's mine, really. This is so fun. Awesome. So let's kick off the fun. All right. Tell us, the first thing that I always ask is like, okay, so there's the bio, and you sure put a lot in there. Um, what's one thing that you would like people to know about you that is not on the bio, that people oh. might not read on the bio? About me? Yeah, like you're a human being, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess in light of the bio, uh, perhaps it's that I really care 
I, you know, I care about this work. I love what I do. I feel incredibly honored and privileged to have had all of the opportunities that have paved the way to get to the point where I am now. Uh, I think that I get just as geeked and as excited over each and every aspect of my career and my workday and the teaching or the research or the clinical work that I do as I did 20 years ago when I got started in this field. So I, I guess maybe that would be something that I would hope people would associate with me is that I actually care a lot and I'm invested in this. I think we should add that to like the applications for grad school. And maybe when you get your C's with ASHA and maybe with all the other levels of accreditation and certification, like they should add some credentials after your name, like you care. Right, I, I that, don't that, care. that should matter. C. I got an extra C for care. That, that should or matter, we should have like four C's. She's got a heart. Or I think four C's would work well. Four, got four C's. H's, for nice. four right. C's. I like it, we'll submit that as awesome. an idea. So when did your first uh, seed of care get sparked? Like when did you realize this was something you gave a darn about and how did that um, like drive you to do what you do for, it's hard to believe because you're only look, you know, like we're not gonna say your age, but you've been here for 20 years. Holy smokes. And me yeah. too, yeah. Um, I'm with you. So what, what sparked your fire? Like what brought you to this? You know, my brother uh, has Down syndrome. So I grew up uh, with a sibling who had special needs and communication um, difficulties. And I think I was expected for a really long time to do something. I, not expected, but I think I expected it of myself to do something where I would be working to help other people, healthcare, thought I was going to go to med school, things like that. But when I became a speech pathologist, I was doing my master's degree in London and they had a residential course, which is a summer camp for teenagers who stutter. And, you know, you're kind of waiting as a, as a speech pathologist in training for that area that's really gonna light your fire. And for me, this residential course, I was so excited every single day to do what we were doing. Um, it was such an incredible opportunity because it was under the direction of Dr. Trudy Stewart. And she was at the University of Leeds, but there were speech pathologists, uh, speech therapists in England, from all over England that all specialized specifically in stuttering that were the camp counselors at the summer camp. So every time I would go to a different activity, I was working with some of England's leading experts in stuttering treatment. And it was, it was amazing. I, and, and stuttering itself is amazing it's there it's so mysterious it's so tricky it's so um exciting it's so profound it it has so many different aspects to it that we still don't understand and really it it was waking up at seven o'clock in the morning and not being a morning person that made me go wow if I can wake up at seven o'clock in the morning every day and be really excited about what I'm gonna do this is it so that that's kind of where it all started. How how appropriate that one of the first people to drop a comment on Facebook Live is none other than Trudy Stewart. And that's what I get out, right? That's what I love about this whole thing is like people come out of the woodwork. It's amazing. So Trudy is right there and I'm smiling my eyes off because yeah. There you are, like talking about she's where one. It's she started it. And what an incredible mentor to have at that point. Right. Well, I mean, she just, just, she's just sending you lots of hearts and uh, bless you, Shelly, uh, for remembering <laughs> that residential and hi from England. She says, and we'll get this in late, you know, what? let's just honor Trudy with this. She says, can you point me as a clinician to the best piece of research with implications for clinical practice? And I assume she's referring to, I guess, you know what she's referring to. I'm not sure in which regard she meant, but maybe she'll say more, but well, maybe afterwards you'll send me some links. We'll, we'll yes, see what we cover and maybe you'll send me some really good references. And then if you go to the blog page, schneiderspeech.com slash our blog, 
uh, I'll make sure that we, Trudy, we put up a nice article for you. And thankfully, um, Shelly Joe will be able to provide more than one or two or yeah. three for those that have that appetite. You know, I'll tell you something funny, what you said about, you know, if you're not a morning person and you're waking up, then you know there's something good. So I generally don't talk. I, I've tried not to talk too much about myself here, but I do want to share. I asked this kid yesterday, it's his like third appointment. He's 16, 17 years old, really burnt out from previous therapy experiences and not easy to step into those. Like there's a lot of pressure because you don't want to be another um, letdown in a person's life. You don't want to be another one to kind of open up this sensitive chapter only to disappoint, you know, once again, and being someone who cares, it's not like we just show up and check in and check out. Like we want to be of, of help and of service. So I said to the young man, I said, you know, how's it going? Um, and he's waking up also at like un, un, unbelievable hours because it was a little bit tricky to make it happen. So he checks in and I said, well, how's it going? He's I'm like one to 10. He's like, oh, 10. Like, wow. I said, What's the best thing? He says, I really like expressing myself. Yes. And his mom is next to him. And he had just gone through like sharing his story of growing up with a stutter. He's now 16. I said, well, like, let's go back and like walk through your relationship with your stutter of what you remember. So like, what's your earliest memory? He's like, well, at a certain age, I remember such and such. And I'm not going to say too much to give away, but he remembers being a certain age and it was like, it just wasn't a big deal. And then he remembers a certain age where it was like speech therapy was like the obstacle of the week. It was like the biggest focus for the whole family. And it wasn't a joyful one. Right. And that's not to blame the therapist or the anybody. It's right. just the dynamic of like many different interests, all well-meaning, but not yeah. yet hooked up. Right. And um, I turned to mom, I said, well, what do you say? Like, how's this going for you? And she said, you know, really nice. I said, what's been good for you? She said, well, he doesn't wake up at that hour for anybody. So the fact that he's waking up at that hour, I don't know what's going it's on. Meaningful. That's good. It's, it's yeah. meaningful, for sure. And I got off another call right before our call now. And I'll just share this. This was also great, just as like a takeaway, take home. And it's why we do what we do. Two parents super devoted to their uh, young kiddo who's stuttering. And that's a shout out right there to uh, you know who. Who says kiddo? Who introduced kiddo to all of us? Barry Guitar, of course. Um, this kiddo thing, we've got to do something about that because it's a little catchy. Um, so these parents at the end of the session, I said, how was today? Dad said, it was really helpful. I said, what was most helpful? He says, I realized we don't need to fear the stutter. We need to fear silence. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, right there. So that's why we share that fire. Um, yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, that's so, totally, totally. Michigan, by the way, is packed and stacked. I only realized that this year. Like Michigan has so many of our best and brightest. It's kind yeah. of unfair. I like, I like to think that I started the trend by being the first to come over here and, you know. That's modest. Entice Scott and Suan to come on. And now we have Hope that's over at Western. Derek, oh, well, you know what? You're right. Derek was actually the first. There you go. Derek, Derek is a trailblazer. Derek is a leader. Yeah. He's the head of the state. He's the head of the state organization, isn't he? He is. He is. President, Michigan Speech Language Hearing. Mm -hmm. Totally. He's so I would, stuff. we talked about so many different topics, but I think truly some people are coming in the hottest. Let's start with genetics. It comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, do you want to just lead with like what you think are like some of the most uh, misunderstood points about genetics and stuttering? And then some of like the straight facts that you'd like people to understand and, and kind of like where things are going with the studies. Sure. Uh, so or I can throw you some softballs, whichever way you want to go. So or hard I balls. Uh, you you can do all all sorts of throwing objects here. Um, genetics, you know, I think the most important thing is that people do understand that it is genetic in nature. I think that we still are working against a lot of stereotypes and misinformation that really got started in the 1950s about people who stutter and why they stutter and that they're nervous or you know, that they were abused or, or whatever those, those misconceptions are. 
uh, I think it's huge for people who stutter, for their parents, for families, for the community, for the, the broader context at large to understand this is a genetic disorder, highly genetic in nature. So, you know, if, if your child stutters or you stutter, there's other family members who also stutter in your family. And because stuttering is the way that it is, some of them may have stuttered as children for a transient amount of time, and they might not be stuttering as an adult, or they might be stuttering as an adult. And they do a lot to kind of wiggle around that, you know, and those conversations need to be had because there's a lot of solidarity that families can really achieve in having these conversations around the dinner table about stuttering and who stutters. And if there's ever moments that relatives feel, you know, I, I find in genetics, as I'm taking DNA from people and asking about their stutter, I'll say, they'll come to participate and I'll say, you know, do, did you stutter as a child? Do you stutter now? Trying to get some information. And I have a lot of people who will say, I stuttered as a child or as a teenager, but I don't stutter now. But when I ask further and say, what about when you're upset or when you're emotional? You, you, do you ever in any situation ever still feel that tension? And they'll often say, actually, you know, if I'm really upset or if I'm really tired, I'll still feel that. So it's interesting to me as a scientist looking at identity of being someone who stutters, how readily someone will say, no, I don't stutter anymore. I've recovered, even though they still do in certain times. And we need to get rid of the stigma associated with that so that people can, you know, very openly speak about that. And in doing so, can offer themselves as support for other people in the family who are working through their stutter, managing it and wanting to embrace it. You know, it really facilitates that to happen. So it's so genetic. I would, I would just, just want to just ping on that for one second, which is, it's so interesting. And I just want to highlight what you said that the value of understanding that it's a genetic disorder should be liberating. It should relieve yeah. feelings of guilt and shame. And at the same time, I, I see a misunderstanding often. And I'm as recently as a few hours ago talking about it with parents, there's a feeling of that that's a prognostic fate. So oh. looking at a young child who stutters and they're searching up everything they can find and they find out and they got questions about genetics. Mm. It's like, well, if it's genetic, like, is it an open variable? And if my two, three, four, five-year-old is stuttering and it is genetic and there's a family history, I guess we better buckle up for a lifetime of stuttering. And I think it's interesting how, you know, what you were sharing and your hope is that it can contribute to taking away the stigma and the shame. And in this family, I said the same thing. I said, look, this father is beating himself up that he said something or he let the child down or he didn't hold their hand at that moment that the dog barked. And at the same time, mom is talking about a genetic predisposition in her family. And I said, well, if we put these together, we've got a very loving, caring parent on one side who wants yeah. to make sure he does the right thing. And that's beautiful. That's going to help the kid. You're going to be part of the solution here of supporting this kid, no matter what happens, win-win. But mom's history story concern actually is a something dad could turn to and say, oh, wow, there's a predisposition. So yeah. that should like allow me to let go of the feeling of guilt. So I right. think that's really powerful. It's a, a very meaningful, emotional, personal takeaway. Yeah, you know, I, I think that our, and I'm sure that you've had lots of people who've spoken to this. We just, it's a never ending mission to educate everyone about stuttering and the nature of stuttering. And just the genetic aspect, I think is really important. It's really critical. Um, and, and it is important within that family landscape, but I think it's also important for all of the listeners that are going to be in your work environment or in your child's school or, you know, just, just the general population to understand that it's a genetic, you know, just to dispel everything that stuttering sometimes carries with it, things that Hollywood have contributed to, or like I'd mentioned before, this, the stereotypes. So in That's understanding, one. sorry. That's one. So one important thing that you want people to know is that your scientific work 
and discovering the, the frequency and the prevalence of the fact that there's a genetic predisposition should be a source of, of relief and contribute to changing the stigma and the shame that is often associated uh, to date. And part of that movement is to recognize it is what it is and it has a genetic predisposition. Yep. Uh, the other thing is that stuttering is very complex. And I really, at this point in my career, are, am beginning to fully understand the depth of that complexity. Uh, it, if I can draw this comparison, um, I was thinking about this last night because I, I like to watch lots of different shows on, you know, uh, scientific frontiers, exploration into space or the ocean, or, you know, I'm, I'm just now learning, um, I'm, I'm listening to these uh, podcasts on quantum physics, because I, I feel robbed of getting to take many of those classes when I was in college, and it's really fascinating. But as a geneticist, it, we truly are astronauts or octonauts in our understanding of what we are working with and dealing with in the human genome and how it operates, you know, in the same way that space feels like an, a huge entity of unknown and, and the, the deep ocean as well, we are in that exact same place as we approach genetics. And the more technology advances and the more sophisticated we become with the way we can look at this, the more we understand how much we don't know. And the mm -hmm. more it, it is really just kind of mind blowing to, to approach the complexity and try to approach the biological mechanisms that are driving stuttering. Because it's so highly heritable, and it runs in families. And, and we are talking about 85 to 90% genetic contribution. So that means- Can you just explain that stat? Because stats yeah. always tell stories, yeah. So a heritability estimate really just explains how much of the trait you're interested in, the phenotype, can be uh, explained by genetic contribution. And we know that all genes are your genes plus the environment, plus your genes times the environment. So the interaction effect between what happens, right? So we're gonna unpack that after. So, yeah. so I can, I, you know, I, I do the, I, I use this analogy in my classes and how I unpack that is you can, and I'm sorry that it's a, a um, kind of a weight loss analogy, but it makes sense to me at least. Um, you can have yourself as, as your person and you can have how much you eat cake, right? That's also for me. Sorry, I'm so egocentric. I love cake. So I have myself I, as a I person. Put, I, put away, I put away my cake and my Ben and Jerry's for the sake of this conversation. Right. And that's going to equal, say, my weight or, or my body physique. But then there's also this interaction effect of how much I've been eating cake, right? So then I have this interaction effect of what the cake does to my body and whatever has happened from the amount of cake that I've eaten. And that actually is what contributes to the end result, right? It's not just a one time, here's cake plus the environment. You, you know, this, if this isn't just me plus cake, this is me plus cake in this time, plus me times all of the cake that I've been And my to. metabolic and the predisposition metabolic effects, and I might training have my- where I might have all of these things from all of that interaction in the past or so. So we can kind of- Would it of be fair to say heritability? Let me just ask you this. Would you, would you say it's fair like also people who stutter, one of the common themes that's come up in these conversations on the podcast is the concern about, you know, coupling up and bringing children into the world and the fear that if I stutter, what's the chance probably pretty high that my child is going to go through that. And I'm kind of scared about bringing a kid into the world like that. And so I always talk high, about heritability. Fantastic that you are such an incredible human being to be the parent of that child, right? So there, t there isn't a downside here. Right. Yeah. You know? What I spin, tell me, put me in check because you're the expert. I say the heritability, the heritability numbers are very helpful looking backwards and telling you how you got to where you are, that it's not your fault. Yes. It's nobody's fault. And it wasn't some experience. There's a super high likelihood that there's this you know, presentation of this trait in your past or maybe carried out 
and not seen and not expressed, which should relieve you of the guilt and responsibility and shame and guilt about that. It is not prognostic in its nature. And oh, certainly right. when you have an N of one, when you have one person, so the likelihood that you could pass it on is, is high if you have a hundred people. But if you have one person, there's no, no it doesn't mean is, is exactly 85%. Statistics on one don't speak the same as they do to an N of a hundred. So I find it liberating and to look at genetics backwards and also, less to prognose. Does that sit well with you? It does. I, I think the other thing that I, is rather exciting to me and meaningful is that we are revisiting all of our epidemiological um, numbers that have been created around stuttering. You know, we've always reflected back to the 1960s and these studies that reported that five to six percent of children will stutter and one percent of adults stutter. Well, since the world, the globe has moved to electronic health records um, and has moved toward well baby visits that are done at very regular increments and surveys and screenings for all of the children at different time periods that are specific to their development for each of those well baby visits, what we have are uh, more accurate population estimates of how often people stutter. And what we're finding globally, and this is um, reported in Japan, this is reported in Iceland, this is reported in Australia, is that the estimates are closer to 10 to 15 percent of people have ever stuttered. And mm -hmm. that is huge, right? So more of the population has a stutter than we ever anticipated. And, and you know, it makes sense to me because like I'd mentioned before, when I ask people if they stutter and they say no, or they did, but they don't now, the reliability of that is sometimes a little bit, you know, uh, they might be answering no to where the population statistics were gathered before, but the answer truly is yes. And we weren't able to capture young children. You know, I, I, I have this all the time as well as I'm collecting pedigrees and trying to look from one generation to the next, what relatives do you know of? And we lose the information. Once granddad passes, who's there to say granddad had a stutter when he was two or three or four, right? Or who's even there to speak to granddad's if he truly has a stutter even, you know, at this point in his life, granddad is the one that would need to, but if he stuttered as a child, he might not have memory of that because as a parent, there's lots of things that my children have gone through that have gone away. Thank goodness, you know, nose picking or who, who knows what, my children, I have two boys, so forgive, forgive that one, but they're not doing it now, which is great. They might not, when they're 90 years old, be able to reflect back on things, you know, whether they had articulation errors or, you know, they might not be able to accurately. Have you thought about how to capture that? in like a time capsule so that it's it's saved for them. So they have those embarrassing moments, the naked pictures Absolutely. in the bath. And, I'm yeah, that okay, kind of a mother. I it will come back up multiple yeah, Very times. important, very important that they, they do not forget they used to pick their nose and run around naked. Right, right. So, you know, I think that now that we have these electronic medical systems and we are doing these well baby visits, we're getting much more accurate data on exactly how many kids stutter. And we're getting much better information now. Um, we just got, my collaborators and I just got access to 23andMe data, uh, which has a question, have you ever stammered or stuttered? And it asks, you know, a couple follow-up questions just about developmental stuttering. And uh, we just got the data, which is 55,000 people who said yes to having had a stutter. But what we get then is the genetics from all of those participants. We get to kind of unpack this. And once we find the genetic variants that sit within this population, we can start to look across all of our population data and say, how common are these variants in the general population? And for people who carry these genetic variants that can contribute to stuttering, what happens to the population that carries these variants that don't end up stuttering and what's mitigating this? 
And that is that genes plus environment plus genes times the environment interaction effects. That's what's really hard for us to capture. Because when I mentioned before that the genetics of stuttering are complex, it's complex in that what we're finding is that the variants that contribute to stuttering are population based variants that are very common. So a lot of what's contributing to stuttering in one individual, those genes can be present in other people who don't present with a stutter. And then that means that we have some interaction effects, some regulation effects, some other things that are happening here that are contributing to this, this phenotype, this outcome, this trait that we get at the end of the day. And this is exciting. This is the pathophysiology. This is the, the great space abyss, the ocean abyss. This is the what is there? What is going on? How can we understand that? Because what we have is the top down approach of these are the traits that we see with stuttering. These are the experiences of people who stutter. This is, this is what people who stutter can tell us about about themselves and about their speech and their and and what's happening and parents and families you know we can see it from the top down and with genetics we can take a bottom up approach and say okay here are the variants that are contributing to the etiology to the cause but the really exciting juicy bits for us as a field is to understand how the genes create the stutter what is happening? And it's more than just seeing an area of the brain light up in an fMRI, or it's more than just seeing an anatomical difference that we see in, in white matter tracks in the brain. It, what does that mean? How does that manifest? What's regulating this? What types of transport mechanisms? What type of metabolic processes? You know, what exactly is creating this disruption in the motor speech plan that has sometimes a very sudden onset. What triggers that? What makes some children recover from stuttering? I, I have two sons. And the wildest thing is that I was working in this field for 12 years before my first son started stuttering. And it's, a, it's on his dad's side of the family. His stutter came on like that no joke. You know, I was working clinically in the field. I was a scientist already. I knew there was family history. So, you know, I was keeping quite an eye on this. And I came home one day, one night and he was just about to turn three years old and we were sitting down to dinner and he couldn't say a thing, not a thing. Everything was stuttered so severely. And when I left for work that morning, I had not seen hide nor hair of the stutter. My second son also had a stutter, but his was gradual and came on very, very slowly. My first son, after working with him, his stutter went away and I will tell you, I never ever see it to this day. It is gone, gone, gone. My second son, it's mostly gone but I still see it. It's still there in those moments. So what creates that difference? What creates that onset that can be so sudden for some children and so gradual for others? What creates- And, and the idiosyncraticness of the hot and heavy coming on with really yes. severe stuttering sometimes resolves quicker or more fully and those that are a bit more mild in presentation sometimes linger longer. So a lot that also upends a lot of what at least common knowledge out there or, you know, up, need for update, like update your app for, you know, version 5.0, you're still on 1.0. You know, looking at the stuttering on the front end is not the only thing to look at in terms of prognostic suggestions right. of whether it's going to resolve itself or whether to get involved or not. We need to look at a couple different things together. Um, but I, I see that clinically, you see it in the research and in your own yep. family, the hot and heavy sometimes resolve more fully than those that are more mild in the presentation. And yeah, so. I, and, and, you know, I, I worked, um, 
I worked in Nicolene Ambrose and Ehud Yayuri's longitudinal study. I was one of um, the student clinicians that helped to run over 1,200 children who stuttered right near onset. And they tracked them and followed them for years doing um, three and six month uh, checkups, you know, at, at those intervals to try and look at those types of trends that I was talking about. Those kids that have a sudden onset versus a gradual onset, what type of prognostic um, indicators can we conclude from either of their, their severity trends or onset trends? And, you know, at the end of the day, for me, as a, as a clinician, as a geneticist, as the mother of children who stutter, as uh, someone who is just really in love with, with the mystery of this disorder as well, I want to understand it. I want to understand it. And that's what we still need. And that's what I'm hoping these genetic discoveries are going to help unwind is what exactly is going on for these kids? What is regulating this? So my, my genetic work really is important because not just for identifying the genes, it's important so we can understand the mechanisms that are driving stuttering so that we can come up with new therapeutic approaches perhaps. You know, sometimes, sometimes it can be very simple and very easy to change the neuroplasticity. Uh, sometimes it can be dietary in nature. You know, we have um, spina bifida with just a folic acid prenatal uh, supplement, you know, and, and that's, that's it. But it took a genetic finding to be able to understand that it's this metabolic pathway that just needs a little boost at this time. You know, I, I, I think that that's really where it's going to be fun and exciting is to not just have these gene discoveries, but actually map it onto the clinical work that we're doing and how, how can we use this to help? Are we there yet? Or, or when do you think we'll close. be there? That so we're close. close. We're very, very close. No commitments. Uh, no commitments, but we're very, very close. Uh, you know, I have, um, through the collaborations with Dr. Janet Bilby um, and Kathy Fillion in uh, Perth, Australia, we have over 250 families with three generations of stuttering. We have DNA on all three generations. Right now we're conducting linkage analysis. We have one family that is absolutely huge in size. We have five generations. We have great granddad who is celebrating his 100th birthday this year, who has a stutter and all of his, you know, subsequent family members as well. It's a beautiful family. They're absolutely incredible to work with. Uh, we are working on really- There's heritability and then there's inheritance, you know. <laughs> They've inherited, They've inherited a, 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 wealth of, a wealth of stuff from grandpa. They they have. So we are right now analyzing all of that data. Um, the pandemic kind of pushed us into looking for uh, data within electronic medical records that we now have available in the United States, um, where we could take, um, I've, I've been collecting samples from people who stutter from across the world for many years and, and we've taken their profiles and their genetic profiles and what we have on the case history and we've used that um, and their DNA to help inform um, a decision tree classifier within an electronic medical record system where we um, data mined for cases that said something about developmental stuttering. So we went in and said, okay, who actually has somewhere in their medical report a reference to having a stutter and not a stutter related to traumatic brain injury or, or any other um, form of stuttering that does exist in electronic medical records. But what is significant for developmental stuttering? And then when we had created this group within the electronic medical records, we then could use their entire health history 
because we don't get access to electronic health records until people have passed on. There are no longer humans to consent for research. So what we have is the entire health history of someone who stutters. And, and we have that for an entire group. When we first approached the electronic medical records, what we noted is that if we took the population statistics and applied it to medical records, there were nowhere near the number of people in the electronic medical records with mention of a developmental stutter in their case history as there should have been to match the population statistics, even if we went to five to 6% of the population. Um, but okay, it's so the population closer. statistics that you were working with before that you mentioned findings of up to 10. 10% mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. incidents. That was based on, what was that based on now? What was that finding? So that based finding upon. was based on uh, publications and reports that have come out of Japan, Iceland, and Australia. So that higher prevalence is starting to emerge. And what's interesting is that when we went to the United States electronic medical records, we didn't even see the 5 to 6%, obviously nowhere near the 10%. So we knew that there were medical records and DNA available to us that were unidentified. So what we did is we took the cohort of those that were identified within the electronic medical records, uh, 30,000, and which is a significant enough pool to actually create a broader phenotype where we can include all sorts of other conditions that seem to be statistically significant for this group of people who stutter. And then we could take that profile and data mine into the rest of the electronic medical records for people that matched that profile, but did not have mention of a developmental stutter. And you and I as clinicians, I'm sure can blatantly acknowledge that there's gonna be a lot of people who've seen the doctor how many times for a million different conditions, and the doctor has never once written down that you have a stutter, right? Oh. I mean, it, that's That's, they don't medically treat stuttering. You're not hospitalized for it. You're not prescribed a medication for it. So really doctors don't make note of it in many instances. So what we were hoping to do was take this profile and identify all of the other people within the electronic medical records that share with that profile who likely had a stutter. And then we can use this combined group to be very well powered for genetic detection. And that's, that's where we're at. So we have that, we have the 23andMe data, we have all sorts of, we're, we're right there. I mean, this is a big year. And um, we definitely have significant findings. And, and for me, before, before I start to broadcast what those are it's important for me to validate oh come on things. come on just I just I just know. a little I you know. can qualify it you said we had to wait till now we I gotta know. drop some I little know. i'm on the edge of my seat hold on hold on uh, okay <laughs> listen the 23 and me let me let me dig a little bit maybe you can like just hint with like a wink or like not you know no comment but with the 23 and me there you said there was a questionnaire. So people actually indicated if they had any observable uh, memory of stuttering. Plus you've got the phenotypes and, and the gene yeah. data. So and my, my collaborator, uh, and, and she is absolutely phenomenal, Piper Bilo, she's at Vanderbilt University. We have worked together, I think for 13 years now, maybe even long 15 years. Um, she is, just absolutely phenomenal. She was the one that first kind of came forward and was like, let's get this data 23 and Brilliant. me you know, was opening this up. So it's been, it's been quite a long legal. Um, yeah, that's a big deal getting that data. We need to get some of this data. But unlike the US records where you said the limitation is in the medical records, there isn't an indication necessarily of a report of stuttering but you're looking at just extrapolating from the data that you know, these are people who reported stuttering, this is the phenotype, we can extrapolate that to a similar profiled group, and then you have something to really work with. Mm -hmm. With the 23andMe, is it better than that? Like, did you get some numbers in terms of incidence prevalence in that group that was different than what you saw in the US data? Because there you have both, you have the observable oh, symptoms. You know, yeah. by the way, in the electronic medical records, when we actually identified this entire cohort of people that likely had a stutter, it's about 10%. 
Hmm. I think I think it's almost eleven. What did you see in Twenty Three and Me? Was it different or was it more? Was it less? No, it it, it was around there as well. We absolutely are seeing, um, and I the the numbers that we are seeing within our data sets right now are between nine and eleven percent from all of the different ways that we have been approaching those in the electronic medical records or 23andMe, we absolutely are seeing much higher prevalence. It's interesting. And you talked about one interesting side of it is like, what's to say the medical professional recorded it? Like if there was a conversation, maybe that wasn't recorded, but we also know, and I think it goes back to, to Aya Erie's seminal work, right? The data was collected from like coming into the clinic and yeah. the people that got to that stage in the process. So the numbers we work with, am I right, are based on like self-reporting coming in for the help to some degree. bias absolutely exists in a lot of these instances okay. and even that five to six percent of the population who has stuttered that we use from kind of the 1960s epidemiological reports you had to have had a stutter for six months or more to be included well we know clinically that there's lots of kids who stutter for less than six months they still should be included in those numbers and your son with your son the one who came on hot and heavy and it kind of resolved quickly and i've had that and my father claims i had a bona fide stutter no one better to decide than dr phil um <laughs> you know it was like one morning and i just was waiting for carpool and it was like a true stutter and it was just that morning and it came and went by the way you got a lot of compliments on your yellow uh, pink yeti from uh, steph steph lebsack I would love to know what you drink in the morning, first of all, because you're always high, high on it, you know, full, full rev and passion. And I'd also love to get your reading list and your watch list. Cause like you said, you're studying, like uh, people talk about space exploration. People talk about the ocean and, and, and how much is yet to be discovered in the ocean. I would say like um, that's outer space and you are exploring your the frontiers of inner space. Yeah. Right? Cellular got to come up with a good name. Cellular cellular space. There's got to be a good like gen, genomic space. You know. I just like a cool suit that goes with that. You know. Yeah. Astronauts, well, better astronauts, better than better than Q-tips. Better than Q-tips with saliva all over them. <laughs> it's, if it's I was not, working with Q-tips and saliva, the, I would want a suit. The equipment that we always dream of as young children, you know. But yeah, like, you were wearing like full PPE before PPE was was a thing. I was, you know, I was trained as a phlebotomist back in the day and would take blood samples. I am very pleased that I no longer have to wrangle people down with needles or carry coolers with blood. Yeah, and it's gotten easier, right? People that want to be part of any of the gene research, yes. it's much easier, correct? Like Absolutely. it's no longer- You can sign up online. It's a very quick consent. I ship you a kit, you, you watch a YouTube video, that is three minutes long on how to give me a nice clean spit and it's a prepaid envelope to send it back. So anybody who wants to be a part of- So not, not getting political, everyone should stay healthy and be tested and get the vaccine and everything. But even if you have a fear of like COVID testing or anything like that, you could still participate in this research. It's yeah, not anything because near- because you're that. not in contact with anyone else, really. You're getting an Perfect. envelope mail. Do it at home, on your own, just a little bit of spit. Yep, it's your too kids who pick their nose could even they could put their boogers yeah. in there. Or, no, I'm kidding. Anything said. Right, right. It's got to be clean spit, not, you know, nothing gross, just spit. Just, um, spit. just spit. Would your so what I was saying was would your son, the one that came on and, and with the stutter and then kind of resolved or myself, let's say, would we would you expect that we would have that presentation in the profile of the genes? Would you expect that that quick onset offset? And are, are, we, are we present in that 10% or we're part of a cohort that's even a larger uh, incidence? Meaning that people who stutter like myself, let's say for a morning or for a kid who comes on with a stutter for a week, it's not gonna be in the uh, medical records. And we know there are those kids that right. have that. If you hadn't had the father you have, that's you right. wouldn't have even known that you stuttered for a week. So it would be that's completely right. absent. From so the incidents, I'm just thinking, and as I often say, and my father often says, but it's really a question I'd love to throw to you. Do you think that as we roll the tape back and we say, well, uh, for kids who stutter for six months or more, these are the numbers we have. For kids who stutter for three months or more, it would make sense that the numbers would even be greater. And as we roll it back, how many kids stutter for a month or more? And what I love about what you're saying, it goes back to the first thing you said, the excitement of the gene research, in addition to the potential to get to a place where it's clinically 
uh, insightful and offering us a better way to provide a response and a support and care, uh, it, it normalizes it. And it says like, it's not your fault. And if we see incidence rates that are higher, it's kind of, I think of it like all the work Trisha Zabrowski and Hope and Naomi working on openness as opposed to concealment. If we can show the incidence in the general population is far greater than we had thought, it's kind of opening that up. Maybe it provides the opportunity for more people to realize you're not, you're not alone. Right. Even if you haven't been to NSA, you're also not alone, but you should yeah. also check out NSA, National Stuttering Association, announced that they're having a live conference this summer. No place better, no more exciting Austin, city. Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas. So um, I'll be you can there. that Shelly will be there. I'll be there and a couple other uh, interesting folks that we like to hang out with. And Friends also. And Friends actually was the first to announce that they're having a live meetup conference. And we should all hope and pray that everything stays well, that we can do this. But everyone's craving to see each other. That's going to be in Denver, Colorado. So you can check that out for checking out their conferences and getting your uh, reservations in hotels fill up fast. So reserve a room, even if you don't plan to book your tickets yet. Yep. Um, and you'll figure out all the details later, but get your vaccines. That's for sure. Um, wow. So for today, is it accurate that the, that what we know about genes and stuttering on the one hand is like blasting us forward with far more knowledge than we had just like five to 10 years ago? That would be fair. Oh yeah. And oh. at the same time, what's the, what, what shouldn't we do with that? Like, what are the limitations as of now? We're not there yet in terms of clinical treatment, in terms of prognostics. Like, is there anything there? Because that's where I see people running into, um, running away with the data, so to speak, and, yeah. and misinforming themselves. Any, any thoughts of just like, how far can we go with this? What are the limits as of now before we get to the point that we can really do some, do some practical, actionable work with it? You know, I've really been trying in my own personal practice of my, my work and my mindset, and my clinical work, and I've been really trying hard to stay in a place of possibilities and not a place of conclusion. So I want, even, even in responding to your question, I want to stay in a place where we can approach this with the idea that the possibilities are, are endless and, and we haven't created them yet. And we have choice with every step of the way with what we do with the information, how we, how we perceive it, how, how we move forward. And we just continually create more and more possibilities with that. But when we come to a place of conclusion or we come to a place where we've decided that this would give us something or would mean something or would do something, we limit the possibilities that could exist by just staying in the question of what can this mean? What could this potentially do? How could this change things? How can it get better than this? You know, how, what, what else, what else? So, so we should, your, your curiosity and excitement is infectious. I feel like I should wear a mask. <laughs> um, Trudy, Trudy's pushing on the, on the clinical implications, but I love what you're saying. So I'm just going to amplify it and see if it's, it's, it's resonant with what you're saying. People should be excited about this journey of discovery that's, that's continuing to unfold. There, there are many exciting possibilities and more and more that you're moving that frontier and moving yeah. it yards forward and the possibilities are wide open. And although today, you know, here's what we've got, here's what we're not sure yet, but we're wondering about, we should keep that open mindset. And at the same time, nobody should jump into the genetics in a way that precludes other possibilities as well. In other words, yeah. don't think that that limits looking at other fields of input or data. So for example, once we get a phenotype or once we can figure out how this contributes to the profile of like subtypes of people who stutter and what kind of different treatment might deliver, we should also still be looking at language skills and, and right. social thinking. And, and I know we're almost out of time, but I have a doctoral student who has created an other health inventory specifically for people who stutter. It's available online. It's anonymous. But basically you go through and you create your own medical history of everything else mm -hmm. that's ever been diagnosed. And that's because what we've found with looking at those electronic medical records is that there's some conditions that are statistically significantly showing up for people who stutter that are completely unrelated to stuttering. But it, it alludes to 
shared pathologies, shared networks, shared regulations, or things that's going on. And when we can look at a broader phenotype of stuttering and understand more about what's going on with your entire body and your entire experience and how all of this weaves together, it can really, Trudy, it can really have clinical implications. And, and that, is, that is the goal, to do something meaningful with this. Well, there's no question that very few could pack so much substance into this limited time. I will tell you, you should feel very accomplished if you don't already. Uh, one person here, Amy wrote, finding out about this genetics took the blame off. And I started to view my stutter just like any other disorder. Um, so I think Amy's one of many people that have you to thank and your team and the people that are really diving into this inner space, the genostronauts, um, with the PPE, swimming in spit and saliva to to really sacrifice yourself. I mean, you're a stand-up paddleboarder, right? Like you probably yes. stand the paddleboard in the lab all over this pool of saliva as yeah. you do your work and data crunching. But it's it's you to thank and your team for adding that kind of knowledge, which not only opens up scientific understanding, but also like personal release of of possibilities and opportunities and just a new story because if someone's living with a story either it's my fault or it's my fault that i did something wrong and that's why mm -hmm. my child is going through this or what's the point my fate is destined you know there, here's destiny i always say that if i had my chance to go join you in the lab and do my phd i would look at intergenerational adaptability or adaptation oh, sweet. stuttering sweet right so if we could if you could think about layering this in you could save me the trouble when you're doing all the data, I would be very curious, great grandpa, 100 year old. Yes. How did stuttering impact his life? How did he bounce back or how did he get buried? Yeah. You know, I think of, of siblings who moved to America, first generation Americans. One of them made a killing in real estate and one of them who was smarter than the other drives a taxi because he didn't want to have to talk to people because he stutters. Yeah. And so for him, that's a precedent of adaptation yeah. probably goes along with temperament as well. Yeah, of, absolutely. And that to me is an indicator for Trudy. I'll give you one clinical takeaway. If you see that in the family line, I think that's as transmissible in a different way. Um, but perhaps, perhaps, I mean, does temperament have a stamp in the genome? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we could look at that too. That to Means me, that would be fascinating. Our overlap. huge, our personality attributes, our inherited, um, and also there's this really cool thing that's that's kind of coming to the forefront on cellular memory and our yeah. cells actually, you know, half of your DNA lived in your father's body for 20 some 30 some years and your mother's body and experienced their lifetimes and your grandparents as well and and there are cellular cellular memories that are carried to you from your ancestors. And we are just now beginning to acknowledge that and dive into how on earth does this happen? And what is this? What is this? Listen, thank goodness for the Helix code. And thank goodness for all these discoveries because they opened up another door and you're going to unlock more and others after you and your students are going to unlock more. We are all evolving with knowledge, thanks to people like you. And we should recognize it's, as you said, and I love that it's such an open open book. The next chapter hasn't been written yet and, it, and, it, and we can't limit what's possible. So Absolutely. with that, I'm just going to take your energy and I'm on fire for at least a couple of days till we talk again. I want to thank you. Any parting words you want to, you want to leave us with? Cause I'm, I'm so stoked. Thank you. Just thank you for inviting me to, to give this interview today. Really appreciate it. Would you that. promise, would you promise that um, if enough people like or request your return, we could do that before 2030? Absolutely. Deal. 2030 though, I guess I, hmm, yeah. Can you find a spot in your calendar? It's I a, can, you know, you got. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it in Austin. We'll do a live, uh, a live something. When you get excited about some presentation, we'll just like. Absolutely, absolutely. This is a Can't big wait. year. Um, there'll be lots of stuff coming out this year, formally. And awesome. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to chat again. Okay, Trudy, you can hold me to it. We're going to make sure that uh, Dr. Shelley Joe Craft sends me some articles so people can dive deeper on this. It's been an enlightening and informative hour. Thank you so much, Shelley Joe. Thank you. Pleasure.